So the, the tool that I'd like to share with you today is Go's Execution Tracer. The command that you use to run that is Go Tool Trace um, to visualize the output. Um, but before we get too far into that, um, let's talk about Go. More, more specifically, let's talk about Go, the keyword. Um, the Go keyword is what lets us get concurrency and the low overhead with which we can create new Go routines and maintain our existing Go routines allows us to use uh, Go routines and concurrency as a tool to solve problems without really thinking twice about it in the same way that you might use a closure to solve a, a programming problem um, when it seems natural. And so the low overhead of, concur of, uh, of Go routines and their concurrency means that we often end up solving problems with concurrency, uh, which means we often have problems with concurrency. And so when solving problems with concurrency, we may, uh, may want to use the execution tracer to really see what's going on. Um, and so this is kind of a special tool um, tailored for Go's needs. Because concurrency is so, such a natural part of writing Go programs, um, it has more of a need for a tool like this than many other languages. Um, and so uh, CPU profiling and memory profiling are fairly common, and you might have used them in other languages before. Um, but you may not have seen a tool like this um, before starting on Go. Um, it's also for Chromium's needs. Uh, a lot of the UI was, was made by Chromium for uh, diagnosing latency issues in uh, rendering the browser UI. Um, and it's been repurposed for uh, visualizing the code that comes out of the Go runtime. Um, and so Go routine scheduling, as I said earlier, is, the, um, is very low overhead, and, is, uh, and, and that low overhead is key to um, the way that we know how to write Go programs. And this is instrumentation that's built into the Go runtime that allows us to see the decisions that are made by the Go routine scheduler. Um, and so it's a, it's a fairly special tool. Um, I, I don't know that it would be possible to write outside of modifying the, Go the, uh, the runtime to get this data. Um, and so this is a tool that can help you with concurrency and how to manage it, um, and with parallelism and how to exploit it. Uh, to make sure that your programs are running as, as quickly as they possibly can. Um, so you might start looking at the documentation for the tool here in the runtime trace package. Um, it describes a bit about what it does um, and po points you to the go, go tool trace command. Um, the docs for that command are um, also kind of brief. Um, and it says, you run this command, it opens a browser. Great. So run that command says, I will now import your traces for you. This is such a like, polite and obedient tool. It's going to be fun to work with. Um, but then you end up with something like this. <laughs> so it's, it's clear that there's a lot going on there. Um, but like, who knows? Um, so we're going to get into that um, today and into uh, some of the other ways that you can uh, look at the data that comes out of the runtime and understand what your programs are doing. Um, so I'm going to do this through three demos. These are all from real Twitch programs that uh, solving problems that we encountered in production. Um, so first demo is on um, diagnosing a timing dependent bug. Um, for the second one, I want to make it clear what it doesn't show. Um, this won't replace all of the Go tools that you use. Um, this will complement them and allow you to look at your programs and understand what they're doing in a different way. Um, and finally, I want to talk about latency during garbage collection um, and what that might look like in your applications and uh, where, it might, where it might pop up. Um, so first of all, a race condition. Yeah, data races. We, we run our tests with a race detector. We might uh, build race instrumented binaries um, and run them as canaries in production. Um, we got a data race. We, we have the full stack traces for, for the unsafe memory access, where like one Go routine was writing and then the other one was reading, um, and which can lead to memory corruption and crashing. Um, but that's not at all what went wrong here. Um, this is about a logical race. And so there was synchronization in place uh, with, with this program, um, but the synchronization was not done correctly. And so although there wasn't memory corruption, the program didn't behave as we expected. Um, 
This is a bug about gRPC, HTTP2, and flow control. Um, gRPC is a remote procedure call framework that allows you to make very low overhead requests to um, other microservices. And one of the ways that it does that, that it has that low overhead, is that it uses HTTP2 to send um, many concurrent requests on just a few TCP connections. And so they're kind of multiplexed on there. Um, so you don't have to create a new connection and do a TLS handshake um, and all that stuff in order to make a single request. Um, and flow control is what makes sure that the receiver is, is ready to get the data, that, uh, that the sender doesn't just like barf a bunch of bytes at the recipient um, and overload its buffers. Um, and so flow control is, allows a, a receiver of, of this data to put back pressure on the sender. Um, and so here's, uh, here's what the execution trace for that program looks like when it's uh, encountering the bug. Um, and just in very broad strokes, over here, stuff is happening. Over there, stuff is not happening. It's not good. Um, this is for a program that, for a server that would send um, very large and very slow responses to its clients. And it was um, fairly typical for the clients to say, eh, I don't need that data. Like, please stop sending it and to issue another request. Um, so uh, I uh, boiled this down into a small reproducible test case, ran it with GoTest. Um, GoTest has a dash trace flag. Um, which allows you to specify a file to write the execution trace data to. Um, and so you might have done this with CPU profilers or memory profilers, memory profiles or blocking profiles for other programs. Um, and uh, so this is, this is another flag in that same vein, although the data that's stored here is very different. Um, so now that I have that file, I pass it to GoToolTrace. Um, and sure enough, we get the web UI. Um, and so there are a bunch of uh, different types of data here, um, dif different, type, different ways of visualizing this data. And I'm not going to go to all of them, but I'm going to go to one of each style, um, because they, uh, only through looking at all of them is it very clear what's going on with this bug. Um, so first of all, view trace. Um, this is the UI that I showed a few moments ago. Um, and there's this one second delay. There's a, a timeline listed across the top. Time goes from left to right across the screen. Um, and so there's this one second delay. And the fact that there's a delay should be surprising because um, this is a reproducer that is making many RPCs and canceling them. And so it's surprising that it stopped. Um, but this, the, the fact that the pause that we see is one second long shouldn't be surprising because that's what I passed to context with timeout when creating the test. Um, and so uh, you can press the question mark key and get uh, a list of help, uh, help text for keyboard shortcuts. The most important ones to start off with are WSAD. You can kind of uh, navigate around with those keys uh, like a video game. Um, there's plenty of other stuff here, hours of entertainment if you're bored some afternoon. Um, so now that we know how to zoom in, uh, we can look at this 20 millisecond segment. Um, Going from the top down, uh, there's a ribbon for the size of the heap. Um, there are ribbons for the number of Go routines that are currently running and that are runnable, and the number of OS threads that are running them. Um, there are, there's an indication of, of uh, stimuli coming into the process, of network data coming in over the network, syscalls finishing, timers firing, um, things that can that come kind of from outside the Go routines and that can make them do stuff. Um, garbage collection is called out pretty clearly here. Um, and then these here um, are Go routines that are running onto OS threads. Um, and that, uh, that scheduling of hundreds of thousands of Go routines maybe onto a very small number of OS threads is uh, fairly key to having the low overhead that we have in Go for starting Go routines, for maintaining Go routines. Um, so next up is the, uh, the synchronous blocking profile. Um, and if you've used uh, other CPU profiles, memory profiles, you've maybe seen a UI that looks kind of like this. Um, these are call stacks um, that were active when some cost was incurred. And so that cost for the other profiles might be bytes of memory allocated um, or number of CPU cycles spent. Um, but the, the, the 
thing that we're spending here is seconds that we're spent waiting. Um, so we can zoom into the lower right, and there's uh, this 1.01 second segment, uh, which is about one second of unexpected delay. Um, we've seen that number before. Um, going up to the top, uh, we have kind of the GoRoutine name at the top of the stack. This will show up in a couple other places. Um, but we can more or less refer to this GoRoutine as ServeStream Spunk 1.1. Okay, so GoRoutine analysis is next. Um, this is a list of all the different types of GoRoutines that were running in that program um, during, during those few seconds that I was recording. Um, and listed at the very top, there are 10,000 different GoRoutines that all, at some point, uh, that, that were all started in order to run ServeStream's Funk 1.1. Um, so we can click that one and get this giant table of each of those 10,000 GoRoutines um, of how much time they spent in, in different states. Um, and so we see synchronous blocking time. Um, here at the top, there's a particular GoRoutine that spent just a hair over one second in synchronous blocking time. Um, go routine 8006. So we can click on that, and then we get another um, uh, execution trace UI like this um, that is only that one go routine and the other go routines that it interacted with during its lifetime. Um, and so uh, on the left, there's a teeny little bit that it runs for, and on the right, there's a teeny bit that it runs for, um, and then there's this giant one second gap in between. Um, so we can zoom in on the one at the beginning. Um, and if you click on it, then you get the ending stack trace um, of what that Go routine that was doing that made it stop. Um, and so we see that the, the stack trace here um, matches the one that we saw in the SVG earlier, um, where there's a, a function called wait that calls select go, um, and then it waits. Um, the, the body of that function is one giant select statement. Um, it takes a context, it takes a bunch of channels, and then it selects, waiting to see which one of them is ready first. And so that might be the context timing out, that might be um, the stream closing, um, or there's also this proceed channel, which is the only channel that returns an actual value we, we might use. Um, it returns an integer. And in all the other cases, we return an error, but if proceed triggers, then we return whatever int it gave us and no error. Um, Wait is called from here uh, in send quota pool. Uh, sorry, wait is called from here. Um, we see that there's this thing called send quota pool, uh, which, is, which shows up a few times. Um, first of all, we add, we call add on that with zero. Um, then we wait. Um, and then maybe we cancel, or maybe we add some value back to it. Um, and so this is, this is flow control in action here in this program. Um, of, uh, of uh, figuring out how many bytes the recipient is ready to get, um, figuring out how much of a payload we can send, and then deducting that amount from the existing quota and putting the quota back in the pool for, for other go routines that might be reusing the same transport, the TCP connection. Um, the quota pool looks like this. There's a channel of integers and a field that's an integer, and so uh, which is protected by by mutex. Um, and when we create it, um, we see that the, the integer channel has capacity one. And so it might be empty, or it might contain a single integer. Um, and we see what looks like uh, might be the beginnings of a helpful invariant here, um, where if the initial quota is positive, that value lives on the channel. And in any other cases, if the quota is zero or if the quota is negative, then um, its value is put on to, into the field. And so um, you, you could think of it as if, if there is a value in the channel, we could sum that value and the value of, of the quota field, and that we, then we would get the total positive or negative quota value of, of that struct. Um, so here, uh, it did not have these, uh, these annotations at the time, but that's, that's more or less uh, what we're setting up for. Um, the acquire function, pretty trivial, just returns the channel, great. Um, the add function is kind of interesting. Um, it's uh, protected by the lock. It, um, uh, it does arithmetic to figure out how much quota is left over. Um, and then it attempts to send that quota on the channel. And if it succeeds, 
then it zeroes it out so that the code is conserved. Um, the cancel function is pretty weird, though. Um, it pretty much explicitly breaks the invariant that, um, that we might hope was set up um, by receiving any value that might be on the channel. Um, and if it, if it receives anything, then, then it adds it, um, adds it to its, its uh, local quota storage. Um, but when this function returns, the channel is definitely empty. Um, and so we might have a Go routine that needs quota that acts like this. First of all, it calls add with, uh, with the argument zero. And what this does is it tries to put something on the channel um, to make that channel ready to receive. Um, then it calls wait, receiving from that channel, hopefully. Um, and then uh, later on, it would call add to like, put whatever unused quota back into the pool. Um, or we might have two Go routines running more or less concurrently. Um, one of them adds, triggering the channel, and then receives from the channel, and then maybe it encountered an error, and so it cancels, and so the channel's now empty. Um, the other Go routine triggers the channel, um, successfully receives from the channel because it had just triggered it, um, and then adds quota back to the pool. Or they might be overlapping a bit more. And so one Go routine could trigger the, the, the quota pool, another Go routine would attempt to trigger it, it's already triggered, whatever. Um, and then the uh, first Go routine tries to grab some quota, does its calculations, puts the rest back. And then the second Go routine um, grabs the quota from the pool, does its calculations, puts it back. This is all, this is all working code. Great. Um, but if we look at, um, at our particular Go routine, the one that's stalled, in context, um, we see that, that here's, here's our Go routine, um, 8006, which is about to stall for one second. And at overlapping completely with that run um, is another Go routine that runs the same function and so might plausibly be running that same code. Um, and they overlap by 36 microseconds. 36 microseconds is a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of time. Um, if, you're using, if you're used to uh, using CPU profilers, um, by default, the one in Go will give you 100 samples for every second of CPU spent. Um, but this is uh, much, much smaller time scales and is pretty much all in the day's work for this tool. Um, so we might um, hypothesize that the overlap is like this, where they both attempt to trigger the pool. It is triggered, great. Um, one of them attempts to get quota, but encounters some sort of error. And so that might be the client saying, I don't want your data, close the stream, please don't send me any more. And in that case, it calls cancel. And cancel empties the pool. Then the other Go routine tries to wait and just waits forever because nothing is going to come along to, um, to trigger that. And so then at some point, that request times out, and it also cancels. Um, but this is maybe the, the source of the stalls that we see. Um, and so the cancel function is basically toxic, and we just need to delete that entire thing and never call it. Um, and the add function, we can change um, so that it maintains the invariant that we were hoping for. Um, and so uh, with the modifications, the add function will always, uh, will always clear the channel, always come up, always calculate the total amount of quota available, and then if it is positive, always put it back onto the channel so that if, uh, so that if there is any quota available, that it is ready to receive. Um, so with, with, that, uh, with that code change, um, then uh, flow control now works, and our application is able to move on. Um, so I want to make it clear, though, that uh, this is just one tool. And if you have questions about when a Go routine starts or when it stops, or if you have questions about why that Go routine started or, what, or why that Go routine stopped, then this tool has that information. If you have questions about anything else, you'll probably need a completely different tool. Um, and so it's uh, for, for that very uh, narrow set of questions about Go programs, um, this is a wonderful tool. Um, to loop back for a moment, um, there are three ways to get data out of your programs. Um, and in the first example, I showed one from Go test, um, where you can pass it a flag and, um, and specify a file. Um, so 
Uh, you can also do this for, for CPU profiles, memory profiles, et cetera. Um, you can use the runtime trace package directly. It takes an I.O. writer. You tell it when to start, when to stop. Um, uh, fairly similar to um, the way that you might directly get a, a CPU profile. Um, and also, if you import the net HTTP pprof package, um, then you'll have a handler installed automatically. And so you might right now be running applications that are ready to have, to, to give this data to you. Um, and all, it's just waiting for you to make that HTTP request to get it and to look at it. Um, so this is um, an execution trace from another program that I looked into recently. Um, and there are a few things that kind of pop out to me here. Um, first of all, there are these sus suspicious gaps every five seconds. Um, it looks like nothing comes in over the network and no syscalls return and no timers fired during that period, um, which is pretty odd because they happen all the other times. Um, and uh, we, we see the garbage collection happens. Um, it's pretty clear that like, there's a lot of activity um, during that time. Um, and also there's this other type of go routine um, that looks pretty much unlike any of the others that might be interesting to look into. Um, so first of all, zooming into uh, one of the sections that uh, one of the quiet periods where nothing really happened, um, there's this single go routine that runs um, in parallel with nothing else for 90 milliseconds uninterrupted. Um, and so looking at the code that this go routine runs, um, it's a call to runtime read mem stats. Um, and because, because we have a, this, this particular server is running on go 1.8, um, or any earlier version, and because it has an enormous heap, it's 40 gigabytes for this one, um, we get these long pauses. Um, the implementation of runtime read mem stats um, had for a long time um, just looked at basically all of the memory of the program in order to give its answers as to how much memory is in use. Um, this is fixed in Go 1.9. You probably just have to upgrade if this bug affects you. Um, looking at the other kind of Go routine, what does that one do? How does it spend its CPU time? Um, can it possibly run more e efficiently? Like, is it using its CPU cycles well? Um, and can we maybe parallelize it to make it finish sooner? Um, those are interesting questions. They're not about Go routines starting or stopping or why Go routines started or stopped, and so this tool does not have those answers. Um, because it runs for, uh, for a couple seconds at a time, um, and, and runs about half of the time. This would be pretty easy to spot on a CPU profile, so we'll use that tool and probably get answers for that. Um, looking at the other type of Go routine that usually runs in this, this program um, is uh, from NetHttp to serve incoming um, HTTP requests. Um, so we might have questions on this one, like what was the request that it served? Um, which actual, like what piece of code ran in response um, to that request? And uh, did we, were we able to give the client um, a good response to the query that they sent us? Um, and again, the execution tracer does not have these answers. Um, it might be interesting if we were able to annotate execution traces with like, hey, I returned a 200, or hey, this was a request for like slash. Um, or it might be interesting to have um, uh, to have a particular key that we can um, that we can use to match up the logs that we have from our application and the logs that we get from here um, to correlate them and see what was on what was going on. But we currently don't have that capability. Um, the uh, the final final section that I want to discuss um, is about garbage collection. Um, Go's garbage collector is still improving. It has come so far, but it is not yet perfect. Um, and so here's uh, execution trace from one of our applications um, during garbage collection. Um, this is a long running server. I made an HTTP request to the endpoint, um, got some data. Um, and so we see during the garbage collection, um, the number of Go routines that are ready to run um, increases. It doesn't increase without bound. Um, it decreases sometimes, but it's still very different than uh, very different than the surrounding times. Um, there's also some patchiness in the inbound network, um, and so when the garbage collection is not active, um, we generally have network requests, like data coming in over the network, basically all the time. Um, 
but then it looks like the clients just went away, and I find it hard to believe that the clients would all figure that out and all collude to not send data to this program. Um, and so there's something fishy going on here, um, probably with, uh, with garbage collection um, and the effect that it has on our programs. Um, and so we see that some behavior is clearly different during GC. Um, it's probably bad that it's different, um, but it's unclear also how, how perfect we should expect the GC to be um, and how, and uh, clearly, we'll have to have some overhead for automatic memory management, um, but it's not clear how and when we should pay that cost in our programs. Um, so to give uh, a history, a brief history of um, garbage collection in Go, um, starting in Go 1, um, the programs would completely stop and like do nothing else. Like Garbage collection would happen, and then at the end of garbage collection, um, the program would resume. And so any requests that were outstanding for that time would just have no interaction um, until GC was complete. In Go 1.1, the garbage collectors started using parallel threads. And so uh, it, it had been that there was a single thread uh, that would look through the entire heap all by itself. Um, but 1.1 changed that, so, so uh, the pauses got faster. Um, in Go 1.4, the garbage collector became precise and so you could no longer trick it into retaining extra memory by having a large integer present somewhere in your program. Um, it would know that that's not a pointer and that it shouldn't retain that memory. Um, in 1.5, huge change in the garbage collector. Um, it now allows the program to run concurrently instead of forbidding it from running until the GC is completely done. And the runtime team announced that their goals for stop the world pauses where nothing was making progress uh, the, their goal for that was to have those pauses be less than 10 milliseconds. Um, and through incremental improvements in, uh, in several releases since, in Go 1.8, um, the, the goal is now 100 microsecond pauses. And those are pauses not of the entire application, but of individual Go routines. Uh, the individual Go routines shouldn't be delayed more than necessary, uh, more than 100 microseconds more than necessary. Um, so that's a much more beneficial um, garbage collection latency goal for us as, um, as engineers and users of this runtime. Um, visually, Go1 garbage collection looks like this. Um, the user code, the mutator, um, is running on the left and the right. Um, in the middle, in between those times, garbage collection happens. Um, and the entire program stopped for that time. 1.1, um, the stop is shorter. Um, in 1.5, um, we see that some CPU is dedicated to the garbage collector, um, but that a lot of it is available to run um, our program concurrently, and that the world is only stopped for, uh, for those two little slices on either end. Um, and then in Go 1.8, those slices are even smaller. Um, so as far as what, what these sorts of pauses look like in the execution tracer and things that you can do to make your programs behave poorly, um, first of all, stop the world pauses. Um, when the GC begins and ends the mark phase, it has to do some bookkeeping. And in order to do that bookkeeping, it needs um, all user code to not be doing anything. And so it has to stop all of those for a moment. Um, but bringing all of the Go routines to a stop takes some time. Um, and so here's one of our programs um, that did not do that very well. Um, we see that the garbage collection begins at that time. Um, but then there are these three straggler Go routines that just keep doing whatever it is they're doing, um, that they didn't get the message that they should stop. Um, and the GC only really begins doing work once they're all done. Uh, and there's a 3.6 3. Uh, millisecond delay in this particular example um, between, uh, between nearly all the Go routines stopping their work um, and, th and them all being able to resume at the end. Um, and so we see that there's this unused CPU during that time. And so this is running on a 36-core server. And so while, so there are 33 cores that are sitting idle while those last three Go routines finish their work. This, this machine isn't doing any other work um, other than just waiting for those. And so that's wasted CPU. Um, and so uh, Go routines are able to stop. The, the runtime is able to, to preempt them more or less um, at particular points where, where they check in. Um, and so that might be when they're allocating memory, um, when they're calling most functions, 
um, or when they're communicating, maybe by sending or receiving from channels or grabbing a lock. Um, but what is not on this list is crunching numbers in a loop. And so if you crunch numbers in a loop for a long, long time, you're probably gonna have this problem. Um, you, if you use encoding base64 or encoding JSON or protobuf, um, you might see this problem. Uh, you might see it with one megabyte chunks. Um, one, mega, one megabyte is a bunch, um, but this is exactly what was going on in, the, in that program. It was using those packages with that size um, and seeing, seeing this reduced throughput because of it. Um, maybe it affects you, maybe it matters. Um, you can seek it out if you like, um, but if you don't already know it's a problem, maybe, maybe just wait. Um, you can, uh, if you click on the Go routines that are delayed, um, you can see the end stack trace of the preemption point that they finally got to. And if you think back a, th a few microseconds to what code those were probably running right before that point, um, if you find yourself uh, looking at a numeric loop, then you might have this problem. Um, it doesn't come across very well on a slide, I'm sorry. Uh, you can also write your own tight loop. This one counts up to a billion. Um, it will mess with your GC. Don't put that code. <laughs> um, there's an issue open for this. It's been around for a while. Um, the Go110 compiler uh, should have a general permanent fix. Um, and so if you don't already know that this affects you, you can probably just wait and your programs will get better. Um, there is a workaround available now um, in both Go18 and, um, and 1.9. Um, I wouldn't recommend uh, enabling it unless you know that you have this problem or are interested in debugging it. Um, and so with that, uh, with that uh, little flag enabled, um, with the same program, same Go version, uh, we, ne we now see that the pauses are very quick and are wasting less CPU. Uh, so other, other ways that the garbage collector can uh, make your program have awkward pauses. Um, so to recap a bit, um, Go has a mark sweep Garbage collector, uh, first of all, the mark phase finds all the in-use memory, and then sweep reclaims all, all of the other memory that wasn't marked. Um, the garbage collector needs to make progress. Um, this was very easy in older versions of Go where um, all of the user code would stop, the GC would make progress until it was done, and then it would resume everything else. Um, but because it's allowing user Go routines to run at the same time, um, it needs to know that, the, uh, that it will finish the garbage collection before, um, before the application allocates too much memory and gets itself killed by the operating system. Um, user code is working in direct opposition to this. Um, the garbage collector is trying to find all of the reachable memory. Um, the user code is trying to make there be more reachable memory. Um, and so these are kind of at odds. Um, but the garbage collector is part of the runtime and the runtime can make things do whatever it wants. Um, and so it can force the user code to help out. Um, and so to zoom in on a few lines of execution trace for what that looks like, um, uh, there's, uh, on, on each of these, these ribbons, there's a top half and a bottom half. And the top half is user code um, running in Go routines. Um, the bottom half is work that it's doing uh, on, on behalf of the runtime, um, which comes in a couple of flavors. Um, first of all, you may not be able to see it yet, but when I put a box around it, uh, you might see that there's this tiny little like half pixel wide sliver that is a read syscall that, that began. Um, you can try clicking on those little half pixel wide things. Um, you can also hold shift and draw a selection box. It's much easier. I was very happy when I learned that. Uh, uh, and there's also uh, mark assist and, and also sweep that shows up as longer, longer spans because there's work to be done. Um, and so that's what it looks like when your Go routines are helping the garbage collector. Um, and so in, uh, at this particular point, um, here's an assist that ran for 4.4 milliseconds. Um, that's, that's a lot. It's, uh, there are also a bunch of much, much faster um, assist spans on here uh, that I didn't highlight. And so many assists are very, very fast. Um, some of them are kind of slow. Here's one that ran for 15 milliseconds and it didn't finish. And it didn't even, it didn't even start then. It's resuming one that it didn't finish earlier. Um, and so that Go routine probably allocated like 10 megabytes of memory. Um, and so it, you know, deserved what it got. Um, most, of the, most of the assists are pretty well deserved and it, and it works pretty well. 
Um, but they also start suddenly. And so you might have a program that has a ton of available CPU overhead that you're handling in just a few requests per second. You might over-provision CPU. Um, but then as soon as garbage collection hits, um, you immediately have to start paying the price of assists. And those can be pretty expensive. Um, uh, so sweeping requires assists as well. Um, that when right after a garbage collection finishes, um, something has to find the, the memory that wasn't marked. Um, and that might be your go routines um, if, if they do it soon enough. Um, so you might see those as well. And so I guess my advice here is to not allocate in critical paths. Um, but that can be really convenient and tempting um, and maybe shouldn't be punished so hard. Um, but I hope, I hope you, know, you now know what that looks like um, and can see if that's affecting you. Um, so please don't take my word for it. Um, the, the command you're looking for is go tool trace, um, and uh, you might be able to get your data from your programs right now uh, by, uh, by making a request to debug pprof trace um, to grab that data. Um, to recap um, how it can help you, um, it can help you to see timing-dependent issues in your code. Um, it complements the other profiles. It doesn't replace them. And so you're still going to use CPU, CPU profiles. You're still going to use memory profile, profiles. Um, but if you have a problem that looks like it's related to latency, um, then um, once you've checked those other, um, those other tools, then the execution tracer can be a very helpful one for that. Um, and so it can help you find uh, latency improvements there. Um, maybe in, in the garbage collector, maybe in, in your own code where it's not um, acting as, exactly as you thought when you were writing it. Um, and so my advice is to be prepared and to practice using the tools. Um, you probably have a bunch of free time now and, and your sites are not on fire. Um, and so this, this is a very good opportunity to take some time and experiment with the tools and, and know what your code looks like when things are going well so that you can understand it better when it's, uh, when it's not working well. Um, so um, thank you very much. That's what I got.